special IPF panel discussion. Uh, the India Policy Forum is in its 16th year, and it's a great pleasure to see all of you. And I see lots of young faces. That gives me even greater pleasure. Uh, not that the older faces uh, are not welcome. Um, wisdom, I'm sure, resides in all faces. But it's wonderful to see such a good representation of young people. So. Um, I'm not going to stand between you and what I think is going to be a rich and very interesting discussion. Uh, the India Policy Forum, as I just mentioned, is in its 16th year at NCER. Um, we've just had two days of extensive discussions around a number of different topics. Uh, and this is the final plenary uh, session that will close out the India Policy Forum. Um, there are no real rules. Tian Nainan is going to chair uh, the chairman of Business Standard, uh, uh, the editor of most, if not all, uh, of the most prominent uh, financial uh, journals in the country, respected both for the clarity of his writing and also the directness uh, of his thinking, uh, which I think is an asset we all need in these times of change. Um, he has a distinguished panel whom he will introduce, and I'm going to request uh, the four panelists, Sebastian Morris, Pranab Sen, Arvind Subramaniam, and their leader, T.N. Nainan, to please uh, join me on the stage. Okay, um, thank you, Shekhar, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, we have two hours of what I'm sure will be a stimulating set of presentations and discussion. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, from now till 8.30. Uh, briefly about our three uh, speakers. Uh, the curious thing about them is that all three uh, have a business management background in their CVs. Two of them, I think, have business management degrees, if I'm not mistaken. And the third has a PhD or a doctorate from IIM Calcutta. Uh, the other curious fact is that two of them have namesakes. Uh, Sebastian Morris is also a racing car driver. <laughs> <laughs> and there is another statistician called Pranab Sen at the University of North Carolina, I think. Arvind, of course, is a double by himself. He makes enough noise for two people. Uh, and I'm reliably informed that uh, since he reads a book a day, I'm reliably informed that the new import duty on books is designed to keep him from preventing him from coming back. Okay, so we'll have, uh, Arvind has a follow-up paper to what uh, he set out. I don't need to spell out the backdrop. I'm sure we're all aware of it. Uh, so Arvind has a follow-up paper, which he will uh, present. Um, he will be allowed half an hour with a 10-minute overlap. <laughs> and our two other speakers will uh, have 15 minutes each, if that's okay. And then we'll go in for open discussion. So, Arvind, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, sir, uh, Nainan. Uh, thanks to Shekhar and uh, NCAER for inviting me. It's a, it's a great honor to be here with this uh, uh, wonderful panel, uh, Pranobda and uh, 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 Professor Morris from IIM. Um, <clears throat> so, so uh, let, me, let me kind of not be too coy and, and begin by saying, you know, it's no secret that uh, this paper has, uh, you know, uh, generated a lot of debate. Um, uh, I, I genuinely want to thank profusely and profoundly, you know, all those who have responded, uh, you know, favorably, critically. Um, I, I, I do think that somehow this is uh, argumentative India at its, at its best. 
I, I think that this is how you know, we should debate and uh, discuss things. And so I see very much this, uh, you know, the first paper and this as being part of this process of you know, uh, you know, public reason, public policy, uh, public debate, contributing to, to, to better policy as well. Um, just, but before I begin, a couple of prefatory remarks. I want to kind of insist that, you know, the objective here is actually uh, very, very clear. It's, it's not about, you know, individuals. It's about, you know, can India, powerful, growing, dynamic, uh, can we have the best data that we need and we deserve? Not for you know outsiders or whatever, but because so much hinges on on getting the, the numbers right, and I think it's for ourselves that I think we, we need to do this. And the second clarificatory remark, of course, is that I mean there is no doubt in my mind. You know, when I was CEA, I worked very closely with uh, with the CSO and with Pranobda quite often. Uh, I'll tell you about some phone calls we've had, uh, but and I have the highest respect for for the CSO, the quality of staff there, and the people who work there. And so it's also it's clear to me that anything going forward, I mean, it has to be done only by them, of course, with inputs from everyone. And it's, so it's going to be very much, I mean, they are going to be the institution that, uh, uh, that has to you know, take this forward uh, in whatever form. Um, so without further ado, let me say, you know, this is the outline uh, of, of the paper. Um, I, I want to say that this is going to be... Uh, elaboration, clarification, providing more texture to the original paper, but also providing you know, some new evidence as well. Um, uh, so, so this is, and also it's going to be a little bit about my journey itself, how I kind of thought about this uh, and where I've evolved now. Uh, and so it's going to be a little bit about process as well uh, as, as substance. Um, so l let me begin by saying that, um, you know, the first, the first estimates came out in January of 2015, and you know, my team and I wrote my first economic survey a month later, and you know, in the in the first chapter we had a very prominent box uh, which said, among other things, the growth estimate for 2013-14 is puzzling. Uh, we also said, uh, you know, how can you reconcile surging growth with these other indicators moving in, in different ways? We also highlighted the fact that, you know, GVA manufacturing and IIP, which is kind of continuing to dog us, uh, flagged that as well. And so the general point was, you know, we need to treat these numbers with a lot of caution. So this is almost my first couple of months. Uh, you know, my team and I were kind of grappling with this. Um, and of course, the, the doubts persisted. You know, we, uh, we did a set, lots of things in between, including many, many frantic phone calls to uh, uh, Pranabda saying, numbers have come out, please uh, explain them to me. And we would kind of scratch our heads together. Uh, then in, in, in July 2017, uh, we had uh, a, another uh, section which essentially said, how is it possible to have 7.5% GDP with weak export credit and investment growth? And there was some cross-country experience. So uh, I'm, and also people will remember that when, you know, when I was here, uh, I was fairly arguing fairly strongly for, you know, uh, 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 monetary and fiscal policy to be less tight than, uh, and, and many of these battles, of course, I lost, but, but that, call for you know more relaxed cyclical policy stemmed from my then strong understanding or belief that you know the numbers were kind of not portraying uh, the full picture for the economy so i say all this not to say you know i've been you know i told you so not at all but to say that you know not only you know the fact of you know grappling with this from very early on but also the kinds of ways we approach this my team and i are very much the spirit of what i'm going to present uh, today uh, as well. So in my view, there are actually two, basically two critical questions. Can we validate the current GDP growth estimates? And then the follow-up question, if not, uh, and this is where I think my sense of the debate is that uh, maybe, and I don't want to over, uh, uh, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, interpret on other people's behalf. I, I feel there's a little bit more of a consensus on this, but I, I suspect that, you know, uh, there's less consensus here. And so, but the critical question is, if 
we can't validate them, is the overestimation small or large? Because if it's small, you know, it's kind of de minimis and you know, nothing really seriously is lost for the economy. But if it's large, there are kind of grave uh, serious consequences. So I want to insist up front also that I made that clear in the paper, very much focusing on the technical changes that were made. Uh, uh, we do not get into any of the political change, uh, you know, controversies about the CSO methodology, about the recent controversies, the backcasting, etc. And also want to insist on the completely non-partisan nature of this, is that the period that we, I, I cover in this uh, paper is this period, uh, last two years of UPA2, and the first, so it straddles both governments. And uh, I want you to keep this in mind, not just because you know, it kind of makes it clear that this is a, a kind of a technical exercise, but also it's going to be important to some of the uh, arguments that I'm going to make uh, later on. Um, so, so let me uh, say, say what the basic approach is, and I think on this uh, th there has been, uh, I would say, a serious misunderstanding. What I tried to do in the paper was not a way of estimating GDP, not at all, because you know uh, it's so. It was obvious to me that you know this is such an elaborate exercise that, that you know nobody outside those who have the data can do this. However, I think uh, it is incumbent on everyone else uh, here, elsewhere in government, outside, especially because there was such a radical change in data and methodology and everything, it was incumbent on everyone you know, to try and kind of you know, do these cross-checkings, what I call a validation exercise. So, so this is about validation, and it kind of recalls what Ronald Reagan said, you know, trust but verify. So you know, I, I, I have absolutely no doubts about the integrity and credentials of the CSO. Um, I, I trust them fully, but I think because there were such massive changes, it was incumbent on all of us to kind of try and validate that. Uh, and so, so it's kind of like a consistency check exercise. And what was, I, I guess, a little bit distinctive about this, I'm not claiming this to be uh, 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 unusual in any way, or is that uh, there have been, I mean, Indian, uh, the Indian debate has been very, very rich on this. Several people are here. Uh, we had a lively session yesterday. But I guess what is slightly different from what I've done and I'm going to show you is that this consistency, uh, I'm doing it from the demand side, not from the production side. Uh, uh, nearly all the debate is focused on the production side because those are the estimates we have. But precisely because everything is on the production side, and you know, it, 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 the one feature of argumentative India is when you're on the production side, you know, you do 20 indicators, someone will say, but you know, you, you missed telecom. And then someone says, no, no, but then on the other side, you missed agriculture. So it's kind of never ending. So in fact, the, my validation is not to try and construct another Li Keqiang index because you know, the Indian economy is too rich, too diverse, and it's, it'll suffer from huge problems of inclusion and exclusion. What do you include? What do you exclude? So uh, I want to use the demand side because we have some, no matter what happens on the production side, some basic relationships on the demand side are, you know, we know to be tried and tested within India internationally. Uh, so it's this kind of validation macro from the demand side uh, with all the assumptions that I'm going to make is what uh, this exercise is all about. So the approach basically starts with the national income identity and says, look, theory tells us that exports and investment drive growth. Uh, largely, I mean, nothing is uh, black and white. Uh, and the evidence supports the view, and you'll see in, in the, in the follow-up paper, that if you look at all the countries that grew at 7% for 10 years, investment and exports have to grow at least double digit, and including that's what happened in India. So, so we're going to make exports and in, uh, imports kind of uh, the driving uh, demand variables that we're going to track. Consumption and imports we know are endogenous. Uh, uh, we also know that consumption cannot be sustained indefinitely without uh, investment in ex exports. So the strategy is CSO produces figures on the uh, supply side. Uh, I'm going to use reliable proxies on the demand side, which are estimated independently of the CSO because that's the exercise. And I've chosen you know, exports and proxies for investment and kind of consumption, which are credit and imports. And, and the slightly funny beast electricity consumption, why I, I chose that is explained in the follow-up paper, but we can come back to that. 
So, so this is where now I get to the central puzzle of this, which is consistent with my uh, earlier thinking. So pre-2011, I've just taken a 10-year period, uh, and I'll tell you, doesn't sh uh, the results don't depend on whether it's 2011, 12, 13, 14, whatever. India was growing gangbusters at 7.7% over this 10-year period, and it generally behaved like a country, other countries that have grown at uh, you know, gangbuster investment, gangbuster exports, gangbuster imports, ga gangbuster credit. So it's like a pretty much, it, India is slightly better on the indicators, but not significantly so. So it's a kind of pre-2011 is a normal, fast-growing country. So post-2011, it's hit by three shocks which affect that entire period and three other shocks that affect some parts of this period. We have deglobalization everywhere, so exports collapse. We have this massive twin balance sheet crisis, corporate stress, soaring non-performing lo loans, credit collapses. We have a shock, a positive shock, the oil in terms of trade, uh, which should go the other way, but I'm going to show you that these, these magnitudes from this are going to swamp this. But in addition, we have, uh, you know, 2012, 2013, and that's why I want you to keep this in mind. The period covered is UPA2, macro imbalance, policy credibility collapsing, culminating in the 2013-14 balance of payments crisis. We have two years of droughts, and we have demonetization, which affects the last year of my sample. So there are these major shocks, and I want to show you what I think is perhaps the one chart, maybe, I want you to take away two, three charts from this presentation, but this is perhaps the most important chart I want you to take away. So we have these, you know, things we are monitoring, you know, investment, I think given that there's some uncertainty about its measurement, uh, have a proxy which is credit for industry, we have exports, imports, credit and GDP. And pre-2011, this is gangbusters growth. Uh, investment, 13%, credit, 16%, industry, exports, 15%, import, 17%, et cetera. Post-2011, collapse in investment, collapse in credit, collapse in exports, collapse in imports, collapse in credit, but no collapse in GDP. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to just think about this chart. And magnitudes, and here the magnitudes are important. 10, this is annual average growth in real terms. 10% real investment growth per year collapses. Credit, 17% collapse, change between the two periods. Exports, et cetera, et cetera. Now, just to give you, so, so, it's, so I want you to also you know, take away the numbers because it's going to be important when we talk about is this big or small. These are huge numbers. Huge numbers. And just to give you one magnitude, so a 12 percentage point reduction in export growth, you do a simple arithmetic, multiply that by the export GDP share, that alone reduces growth by three percentage points. Just the export collapse. Um, uh, so, so I want, and so if investment collapses and you know, imports collapse and credit collapse, you have to then work through the math. But what I want to convey to you is that, I mean, I find this an absolutely stunning chart. And I would go so far as to say is that if this chart is right, then certainly my understanding of India and macro needs serious revision. Um, um, so how can we explain this? And I'm going to come to you know, the possible explanations. One, major NDA2 reforms, which there were several major ones under the government previously. Transformational GST, which I think is truly transformational politically, administratively, technologically. Potentially transformational IBC, I'll tell you why it's potential. Absolutely transformational, I call this welfareism via the public provision of essential private goods and services. Uh, you know, this is the signature uh, a thing associated with the prime minister, cooking gas, toilets, etc. I mean, it's just really potentially transformation, uh, uh, transformational. The point is that the growth impact of the GST is going to be medium term, so it is not in my analysis period. The IBC, we all agree, is still a work in process. So it, again, it doesn't affect this period. And this, of course, is transformational from a quality of life point of view, but it's not obvious that it's going to, uh, would have affected growth in this period, except possibly via consumption, and I'm going to talk about that in just a second. So, so, so this is, I think, I, I don't think this explanation works. The second very fair and reasonable and thoughtful comment, I think, which Pranopta has made quite a bit, which is that, you know, productivity surge, could that be an explanation 
for this. You know, you, know, you don't have, need to have uh, this, but productivity could grow. Point one, I mean, first, this smell test. Do we, anyone here really believe that the last two years of UPA2 could have seen a productivity surge? I mean, there was complete policy collapse and you know, we had a mini crisis. Then, this is the advantage of doing this from the demand side. You say productivity is growing, say surging. It has to show up somewhere on the demand side. Exports, because if your productivity is growing, very competitive, and exports have to go gangbuster, we just saw it collapsed. Productivity is growing, investment has to surge, collapsed. And sign one, productivity is growing so rapidly, profits should be rising. Real profit growth of the corporate sector over these two periods, before and after tax, collapses from 20 to 25% to negative growth. So, and again, I want you to look at and absorb the magnitudes. We're not talking about, you know, half a percent, one percent on any of these magnitudes. We're talking about huge, huge changes. So, is it possible that there could have been productivity surge? It's, I mean, I've, uh, Robert Solo famously said, I see this everywhere but in the numbers. Uh, it's very much, a, I mean, you don't see it in the data. If anything, this is this smacks of a, a kind of productivity collapse rather than a productivity surge. So explanation three, consumption surge. Well, the consumer confidence survey says it headed south. There was a blip up uh, when, uh, the UPA, when the gov this government came to power in 2014, but over the period is rolled downward. In the index of industrial production, a, a growth collapses by half. So, and then of course, whether it's consumption or productivity, if in, you could say, well, investment is not picking up, but capacity utilization is going up to absorb this. Capacity utilization collapse. It grows in, from the early 80s, high 70s, to the low 70s. So productivity, consumption, reforms, they're not showing up anywhere. Not only are they not showing up, all the indicators are going, you know, I mean, you know, f I mean so badly south that, that it's not even close in terms of what's happening. Now, <clears throat> so summarizing the puzzle, you know, one commentator said that, Oh, credit, we can have creditless recoveries. And I think that's a very good point. But pre-2011, India was a normal, fast-growing country. But we had investment-less, profit-less, export-less, credit-less, boom. 7% boom with no investment, no profit, no export, no credit, uh, probably no consumption, no productivity surge, and we had a boom. I, we continued to grow at 7%. So ladies and gentlemen, I, I think this is not, I'm not trying to be a dramatic thing, but the numbers just, I, I cannot absorb these numbers without realizing that there's something you know, going on which we don't understand. So let's explore the puzzle a bit further. Uh, people have said, again, a very fair and reasonable point. Oh, but uh, uh, trade collapsed everywhere in the world. Exports collapsed everywhere in the world. So what's so special about India? Uh, so we're going to take up that argument and then take it a bit further in terms of, you know, the econometrics which has been commented upon so much. So let's go back and do the same exercise. I've chosen six emerging market countries. I mean, these are the, most, these are the biggest. I've left out Russia because it's obviously a commodity exporter, so it's not comparable. And I want to go through the same exercise with other emerging markets. Same, same macro demand indicators. For these, the average, you know, these things, everything, everything is heading south for everyone. India heads south by almost double. GDP by half. Let's take, compare with China. And what is interesting with China and what people don't realize is that in terms of the globalization shock, the export to GDP of India at, in this period, roughly, China is a little bit above us, about 24%, we're at, we're at about 23% or whatever. So, China, similar export shock, similar investment shock, but the credit shock is very different because China doesn't have the twin balance sheet crisis. We had that. In fact, what China did after the crisis was to pump credit both fiscally and monetarily, and, okay, so, 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 so we had one more at least major shock. Oil effects both were similarly. Chinese growth, 3.5% pitch point decline, Indian growth, 0.8% pitch point decline. So, so, so this is the, so, so you say, oh, India is special, 
uh, you know, the globalization, or you say, no, it affected everyone. But yes, it affected everyone, but uh, I mean, the numbers ha happened very differently there. You know, when you had the, if you have half the shocks and you have double the GDP decline, and similarly in China, again, I feel there's something we need to understand because we don't fully understand this. Um, <clears throat> so, so essentially, the econometric strategy was just building on this. You know, you basically regress a, a GDP growth. So it's essentially combining an India across time comparison and other countries across time, and just saying is India different? If we were, were we unusual, uh, usual in the first period, and did we become unusual? This flipping. So some countries can always be overestimated, some can always be underestimated, but you know, there are very few countries that actually flip. Uh, some do also, and I'll talk about that, but this flips. And essentially, this just confirms, this is not, I'm not hanging my hat on the econometrics, but it just confirms the intuition that we're on the line pre, and we go massively off the line after. Uh, so, so, so this is just, okay. So now I want to do, provide a little bit more texture. Is the 7% plausible? So one of the things we did, uh, I, I did was, let's go back 1980. Let's try and capture all the experiences similar to India. And since India grew, this was the investment export combination for India, and India grew, grew at 7%, I said, let's take all the 7% five-year uh, uh, country year experiences. I think there were 69 involving 26 countries. The median values of export, investment, import, credit to achieve the same growth as India for this sample was triple in, than India's. <clears throat> and, then, okay, and then you can do the reverse calculation. If you have India's combination of investment and exports, what is the performance of these countries? The median value is 3%. Nobody grows more than 5.5%. And even these countries that grow at 4.5%, their credit and import numbers are much bigger than India's. So I'm gradually kind of leading you into magnitudes. So, so we're talking about these kinds of magnitudes for other countries, for India's combination of the major drivers of growth. Now, uh, sure, so, so, so I've completed the, you know, all the facts and, and the main results. Uh, and, and the main result from the econometrics was I did give a range, 35 to 5%. Uh, but it's a range, there's a midpoint, and you know, we can talk about whether that number is precisely right or not. But the sense that I want to, uh, to, to insist is whatever you think about the number, it is large. It's four and a half, four, five, it is large. Uh, now, so, so in the paper, and this is something that Pranabda and I have spoken a lot about, I tried to trace through what are the mechanisms, and this has been written very richly by Professor Morris and several people in India, that you know, formal manufacturing has always been a problem, and I just showed what others have showed, that you know, in the pre-period, the wedge is one, between IIP formal manufacturing and gross value added formal manufacturing, uh, the correlations flip, but the average values go from, the difference between the two goes from one percentage point to six percentage points. Shoe change after the methodology. You're measuring the same beast, but one is a volume indicator, one is a value added. But, you know, so there should be some divergence, but it can't be huge and it can't be productivity because I've just shown you that, I mean, there's no way there was a big productivity surge. Uh, <clears throat> but as I said in the paper, that this can only explain part of the large overall estimation, because even if you do some simple arithmetic, this differential manufacturing is still only 17, 18% of GDP. It can explain you know, five times 17, about maybe at most one percentage of the overestimation. Then I want to show you my, you know, a new killer chart. It struck me that, you know, yesterday we had this we had discussion on deflators. Professor Nagaraj spoke about it. Again, written, uh, I think Pranabda has written on this as well. And I was doing the numbers and then kind of, you know, looking at the numbers, something, you know, kind of really a light bulb went off. Because this is only manufacturing deflator. Let's look at the overall GDP deflator. <clears throat> so, so for all the countries in my sample, which are, uh, you know, high and middle income countries for which there's data. This is the wedge between the GDP deflator and the CPI deflator uh, index, Infl the differential in the wedge average every year. 
And India is kind of, you know, zero point. So CPI exceeds GDP by about 0.6% in the pre-period. And again, India is not, you know, it's not an unusual performance in the middle. Post 2011, India is the second highest. And the average inflation dif wedge differential between the two goes to three percentage points per year. Now, again, I want you to think about the numbers a little bit, is that for any given nominal GDP growth, if GDP deflator growth is underestimated, and again, don't hold me to any specific number, but I mean, what this does suggest is that it's somewhere, it's, you know, let's say this, it should be constant by whatever, but so the differential gives a sense of what, uh, the, the overestimation, uh, yeah. Yeah, 2000, sorry, 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 it's, it's, I'm sorry, this is the post period, 2012 to 2016. Sorry, thank you, thank you very much, Divisha. So if GDP deflator growth is underestimated by that, that by definition is the real GDP growth overestimation. And this has, and I still haven't, which I'm not going to because I know nothing about it, this doesn't even get to the nominal GDP growth overestimation related to all the issues surrounding the uh, MCA database. I don't know whether it's over or underestimation, but that's going to be additional to, which what most people think, maybe it's going to just subtract, but the magnitudes are what I'm saying, in addition to everything that I've shown. So for me, what is striking is that the pattern and magnitude of the GDP deflator anomaly is identical to the GDP growth anomaly. At pre-period, we're kind of normal, both on prices and kind of value, real values. Post-2011, you know, we become massive outliers. Um, <clears throat> so now we come to uh, the, object, the big objection, you know, uh, Nine and Montek, everyone says, you know, we kind of numbers, the large overestimation we have. So the logic goes something like this, expressed in a prominent column. 4.5, remember, don't hold me to it, but this is my, you know, let's say it's, it's the large number. 4.5% is a disaster. India by no means is a disaster. So therefore, growth cannot be 4. Point, ergo, cannot be 4. Point. And I'm serious, this is kind of the, the, the logic of what people have been saying. I, I, I'm not, uh, this is not facetious. This is exactly how people have been saying this. And I, here I'm going to digress and be a little bit kind of, you know, do this idiotic amateur, you know, collective psychologizing, is that I'm trying to understand where this resistance is coming from in the face of all this evidence, because I do think this is, a, again, a very fair, legitimate kind of way of thinking about this. I think there are three benchmarks that people have in mind. They say, four and a half, that's getting us close to the pre-90s. How can we today be anywhere close to that you know, disaster period, the Hindu growth rate uh, of that? Second, how can we fall so much from the uh, boom period? No way, we're India, we're a great country. You know, we had seven and a half, eight percent. I mean, there's no way we can come down so much. And the third is, oh, we're way below our potential because, you know, uh, uh, implicit is that people don't buy into this new normal. They essentially think the potential is what it used to be. And I'm going to argue that each of these is cognitive benchmarks need to be adjusted. Uh, okay. I would argue that, it, yes, it represents some underperformance. It's by no means a disaster or bad. It's actually, I would say, good, a good performance. Four and a half percent in the current is actually very good. Uh, not very good. It's, it's, it's good, underperformed, but it's good, but it's not a disaster. And just a few clarifications. I mean, the pre-90s comparison, in my view, is a little bit wrong because it's three and a half percent per capita. 4.5 is three and a half, three plus percent per capita. It's more than twice the pre-1980s per capita growth rate. In the Hindu growth rate before the 90s was one to one and a half because population growth was so much higher. Today we're doing three plus, so it's a doubling. And it's a doubling that's happening at a bigger economy and a richer economy, which goes against the convergence grain. Essentially, convergence says the poorer you are, the faster you grow. But here we're actually growing much faster, even though we're richer. So it's actually a, a good performance. I mean, you know, again, I, I'm not kind of cherry picking, but we have d different benchmarks in mind. Certainly one benchmark is, you know, uh, where do we stand amongst the largest economies? We would still be the second fastest growing economy that's greater than one trillion. We would be substantially faster than the third largest growing economy, Korea. We might even be the fastest growing economy if China's growth rate is properly measured. 
So, so, so 4.5, far from being a thing, is actually very respectable in the current circumstances. Now, what are those circumstances? The second benchmark. I think we have not adjusted to the fact that this twin balance sheet problem that has afflicted the financial private sector, I, don't, I honestly don't believe that we have internalized that this can have serious and persistent growth consequences. And why is that? And I think it's, it's actually, I'm sure there's some behavioral thing here. See, we are, I think, a, a, as a country, we are quite willing to accept that if you have a shock, oil shock, macro shock, you know, a stock market shock, growth can come down. But when this is a slow cancer and not a shock, we still haven't internalized. And, and you look at the cross-country evidence, you know, and, and you saw the difference between China and India. Everything else is pretty similar, but in one case, credit surges, the other case, credit collapses. And, and this is with us. So in a sense, this combination of globalization, collapse in investment, collapse in credit, is something that we're not used to ever, at least since 1991. So I think we can't accept that this can happen. But I think the problem is with the benchmark, not with the data. Similarly, I think because of this, I think you have to revise your potential downwards. You know, you revise it by three of, and remember, remember these numbers, just the deglobalization shock is three percentage points. The investment shock is easily two to three percentage points. And you know, you're talking big numbers. I don't want to be held to any number, but you're talking big numbers. You're not talking half, one, one and a half. Uh, <clears throat> objection number two, very thoughtful uh, piece by someone in the Indian Express saying rising tax to GDP ratios are inconsistent with you know, my decelerating GDP growth, especially large. Okay, first, let's be clear that inferring real growth from revenue performance is tricky because we must account, because in addition to growth, uh, policy changes, enforcement changes affect ta uh, the tax. And we know for a fact that on this, excise taxes went up by 0.8 percentage points of GDP because of policy change. So we can't look at, uh, you, you, actually you go back and look at the indirect tax numbers, also you will get a similar figure. But, so let's look at the one that's relatively less afflicted by this problem, direct taxes. Nominal and real, they collapse before and after. I and again, I'm not saying that this definitely means slowing GDP growth because so many things are going on, but certainly it's more consistent with collapsing GDP growth than surging GDP growth. And another point, real income tax collection growth in this period, is this is something like 3.7%, and that is lower than even at 4.5%, so there is no buoyancy to speak of which would suggest that you know, we're growing, uh, GDP is surging. Now, in the interest of, of time, uh, Mr. Chairman, sir? Yeah, five minutes. Oh, I do have six minutes. Okay, good, good. Uh, so, a uh, number of technology, methodological issues were raised. I think, how can GDP be overestimated with just four variables? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, honest to God, I was not trying to you know, replace the CSO. You know, uh, I have to be either so vain or so stupid to think that I'm going to replace that whole apparatus. It's just about you know, trust but verify at a time when you know, s radical changes have been introduced. Overlooking productivity growth, uh, a big uh, and thoughtful response. I think I've dealt with that. Revenue performance, I've dealt with that. Growth cannot be too low. I've dealt with that. Now, the paper is going to have all this in much greater detail. Someone said start the clock not in 2002, but 2004. Uh, done it for every year from 2002 makes no difference because the underlying logic is that, yes, if you move to 2004, your growth does go up, but then so do all the other indicators, and what we're looking at is the, is the comparison between the underlying indicators and the growth, and that doesn't change. Uh, you know, someone said, you know, I showed in the paper about how correlations flip, changes in structure, flipping has happened before, and true, I think flipping can happen, structures can change, but why should all these macro indicators like exports, imports, credit be negatively correlated with GDP growth? Why should GVA manufacturing and IIP manufacturing, they may have weak correlations, why should, why should they go from strong positive to negative correlations? I mean, it's, uh, um, and then there, there are, you know, uh, someone said there are also other outliers. It's 
true that there are other outliers, uh, but India is amongst the highest. And, and you know, uh, in, 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 uh, in any case, you know, uh, my argument, which I'm going to talk about, which I'll come to in just a second, is that, you know, this is one amongst a, a, a lot of evidence. Uh, there are other checks. I mean, I don't want to bore you with all the technical stuff. It's in the paper. Uh, and, you know, I'm happy to take uh, uh, questions on that. So uh, I want to skip through this and just go to my conclusions. So, and the way forward. Conclusion is that, first, I used a framework not to estimate, but to validate from the demand side, from the macro side. That is the spirit and explicit aim and what I do. And then I want to argue is that I've not just you know, presented a regression uh, you know, that, of course, you know, as regressions go, we know so, they may work sometimes, but I thought it was sufficiently robust and consistent with everything else. But I've given you a variety of evidence. One, how can India sustain such high growth post 2011 despite suffering such large nag? That's my first chart that I want to kind of keep you to keep in mind. And which the emerging markets afflicted with fewer shocks experience larger increases in growth. So that was the first piece of evidence. Then is, is the econometric things. You know, if you enlarge this, you know, check the, is India an outlier again before after uh, the pattern changes. Uh, I've showed you in terms of magnitudes, country, other countries with India's, uh, uh, no country uh, has grown at 7% with exports and imports less than 5%, and India's are 3 and 3.2%. And with an export investment combination, the median growth is 3%. So, so India clocking much higher growth than other countries with the same in export. A large differential between manufacturing growth which, which others, Pranabda has pointed out also, uh, is there. And uh, again, new evidence, the GDP deflator possible underestimation. Uh, and again, as I said, uh, GDP deflator and, and GDP growth uh, patterns are the same, magnitudes are consistent. So, I mean, it's possible that, you know, each and every one of them, there could be, you know, uh, you know, some things that you may want to disagree with, and I think we should continue that conversation. But, you know, all this evidence put together, uh, uh, to me, uh, is very strong, or at least the burden of proof now is on the others to try and explain these set of facts uh, in a manner that's consistent with something close to our current uh, estimates of GDP growth. So way forward, and I think, uh, and Rakesh Mohan put this very well yesterday, that you know, all that matters now is, is now how we take this forward if this evidence is kind of close to being uh, 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 correct or not. Uh, I think there are some outstanding issues which we discussed yesterday because I think there are also the nominal GDP things which we need to talk about. Are there other ways of validation? I mean, I've given you one method, maybe others, and Seb Sebastian is going to give you another way of ma validating it on the production side. We can talk about that. Critical question, I'm almost done. Uh, don't stare at me like that. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, he's now going to call me Gorek because he, well, I'm one of the four horsemen, he says, you know. Um, so, <laughs> so critical question, you know, I think this is, I think, the critical question. Can we accept that there's been substantial mismeasurement warranting a revisiting of the G GDP estimation procedure? And I cannot insist on this. Because I think for me, finally, it's actually a very hopeful story. It's actually a very hopeful story because I've been intimately involved in the GST. And just to let you in on a secret, in the 2018 economic survey, uh, we did a chapter on uh, the GST based on disaggregated data. Uh, my team and I were stupid and foolhardy enough to think that we spent a whole month saying, Let's use this to try and come up with you know, demand side estimates of, of GDP growth. That was stupid, vain, hubristic, because you know, obviously this has to be done by uh, the CSO. But the point is this, the point is that we can for the first time come up with expenditure side. India is one of the major countries that still does not have, does not measure GDP from the demand side. We still do it on the production side. And I actually think that informs the nature and level of discourse. You know, we're all talking about one sector or the other. You know, but the broader analytics of how we should think about growth gets, you know, we, we don't have the space and the data to have that conversation. My last bullet point, I think the best gift that India to, could give to our great, lovely, and lovable TN, 
whose spirit and work and indeed his obsession with good measurement imbues this year's conference. Thank you very much for your patient listening. Um, I have only a very small uh, question which you, if you feel like it can come back to later, that you don't look at the trade balance as an issue. Yeah. And there's an early, in the earlier period you have a negative trade balance, subsequent period you have a positive trade balance, so actually it should boost GDP relation yeah. in relation to the I'll, earlier I'll, period. I'll come to that, I'll come to that, yeah. So, okay, so you can come back to that later, but uh, Professor Morris. Special thanks to Shekhar for in, and Nagaraj for inviting me here. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here and making this presentation. Actually, what kind of got me interested in it was the economic survey itself, uh, which way back when I went through it, kind of hinted. And short of writing the final conclusion, it had already given enough for most people to conclude that there could be problems with the way the data is. Now, it was very important because as a, as a faculty was to engage in executive education, I see people from industry, probably about a few thousand every year. Okay? And I do the current status of the Indian economy for these people. And it was becoming very difficult to argue that the growth is what the data is reporting. Because here are people who would come and say, hey, look, yeah, do you really believe it is, th it is this, it is eight? to seven, etc., And uh, one had to look much more closely at the reality, etc., and build on that basis. So this is a theme that the Indian growth is perhaps quite underreported that I have been using because other, otherwise I would not be able to hold forth with the audience. Okay. Now, uh, let me say what this is about, you know, and I think uh, Arvind Subramaniam brought out that this is from the supply side. That is largely true. So what I do is I extend GDP 0405 after finding strong correlations with GDP of the growth in GDP 0405 using YOY, that is quarterly data, Q on Q. Do so for actually at the components of GDP and then aggregate this and then project this forward using those dependent variables, and then aggregate each of these components using the relative sectoral shares, which are 0, 4, 0, 5, 6 sectoral shares. So it's a constructive effort. It's like trying to pretend what would have happened if I can find strong correlations between GDP 0, 4, 0, 5 and some other variables. All correlations are done in growth rates. So there is no question of any issues of non-stationarity, co-integration, etc., and simple OLS can be used. Okay. I use as much as possible physical measures that are definitionally or as elements involved. So again, here, this is not an attempt to, to understand GDP or any such thing, or its determinants or its causation. It's simply using statistical, you know, uh, correlations at the growth rate level. So it's not at level levels. It's not between levels. It's not log. It's not log of GDP versus log of something else. Let's say log of manufacturing GDP versus something else. It's growth rates. And to find good correlations in growth rates is actually very difficult. Okay. So when measures are nominal, use. However, if I can't get real measures, and if the measures are nominal, then I use both nominal measures and a set of price indices. The problem of possible collapse of degrees of freedom is there, but it's addressed by working with principal components. Okay? Usually not, usually only a few in few are give sufficient degrees of freedom for the estimating equation. So I don't need to use more than about six components, you know, components at any time. Typically about four components work. Okay? I'm not even interested in what these components are, because it doesn't matter. The entire variance comes out, and as long as I can get a good model that explains GDP 0405, 
I can always extend it to the future. So I'm not, as I said, explaining or understanding GDP, but I'm simply using inertia and other definitional ideas, uh, definitional measure there, which could not have changed actually that rapidly. Then I recheck with other variables, uh, you know, yeah, and I go ahead on that. There's no estimation on agriculture. The reason is, of course, for quarterly data, well, agriculture anyway makes some assumption to arrive at the growth rates and so on. Now, pre-study findings, significant you know, difference in growth rates, not in levels or log levels between old and new series is already there over a period where there's an overlap. This is well known, okay? So there, of course, the degree is about 1.3% in GDP. So there is a period where the two series actually overlaps, and that gives already a difference of 1.3%. So difference in overlap period even in the growth rate of nominal GDP. Now what's worrying is not the levels. I don't care what the levels are. Nobody can be sure about what India's GDP level is. But when there are systematic and repeated differences in growth rates running on the same direction of the zero line, you know, then there is a problem. That means if it is more like, if it's like white noise difference, it's okay. But it's more like black noise difference. And that's where the problem is. Okay, RBI itself had raised doubts and hopes, you know, that it would get corrected at least in two reports in 2015, I think May and December reports, if I'm not mistaken. I've given that. In the uh, questions have been raised by, uh, you know, by in the economic survey now more formally presented by Arvind Subramanian in his paper. Okay. My personal experience, as I said, has been very important in this. Uh, questioning the, the GDP growth. Now, what are the findings? Significant and beyond doubt overestimation in a number of sectors. Okay? Manufacturing, as much as 4 5%. Trade, transport, storage, hotels, and communication services, again, about the same thing, and similarly, mining. Mixed pattern in construction. Okay? Not unlikely, because, you know, towards the latter period of the current, uh, I mean, of, of the of Modi 1.0, the government expenditure did move up, though not in the first two years because of extreme centralization or whatever. Okay. Underestimation, some underestimation in financial, insurance, real estate and business. So, it, so the model actually in some sectors is giving an underestimation rather than an overestimation, but not very large. Okay. So overall, now when I say this, it's a most conservative, I'm absolutely sure about this, figure of overestimation is about 1.3% in the first three quarters, 12 quarters, where the models are most robust. Okay? Remember, this method loses its validity with the passage of time because these correlations can go. But what it does show is that there is a figure of overestimation of at least 1.3% in the first three years, that is in the 12 quarters. Okay? Now, I won't go into AS study because he's already answered most of it. The only thing I'll, I'll add to that is that it's almost, it's very, very rare to see in any panel or what we call a cross panel regression or a cross country regression for a country which lies, let's say, above the regression surface to flip over. Typically, it will lie for all the time periods above or below. Okay? That kind of a flip over warrants really detailed examination. Okay? I would add one more thing that the use of tax is not justified not only on account of major regime shifts and so on, and of course we all know that once the, you know, the, uh, what one would say, the, you know, the fiscal stimulus was exited, the tax rates fell, not only that, but for the emergent, or rather the phenomenon of tax terrorism, which was always there, that means the CBDT, even in a low performing year, you know, let's say the, the nominal GDP is some 12%, now, even if the nominal GDP is 12%, uh, the demands by the finance ministry can be very high on the tax guys. So what they do is they send out notices to all the PSUs and everybody, please pay up. You know? So demands can be made on SBI, on DHEL, on the big guys. You just pay up, no questions asked, go to court if you want to. So they all go to court. And then, of course, the government will lose the case in the next subsequent year so that the tax targets can be met. This is because the CBDT guys don't have a model of tax with which they can negotiate with the, with the, with the finance minister. So this has been a phenomenon which has been going on not just in this current regime, but also in the previous regime. Perhaps in this regime it has come down. So the CBDT officers cry and tell us this. 
But the reality is that those guys don't have enough gumption to create a model and argue back that, look, this is not on. You know, if the nominal GDP is 14 or 12, I can give you 2% more, but not 20% or whatever, you know, indirect tax buoyancy. But however, they just simply accept the target and this is how they meet it and then they pay it back. You know, then they allow the companies to claim back or they lose the cases in court. Now, this is a standard practice known to all the <laughs> chartered accountants and tax experts. So, I'll add one more reason, you know. Uh, for why not, why one should not use, uh, you know, tax data. And, uh, yeah, so, see, the manufacturing estimates are quite similar to what I, we have estimated by using an entirely different framework. And as I said, the manufacturing es estimates are far more robust than the other estimates because the correlations are much, much stronger on a growth rate basis. Yeah, the regression need not be a ca causal model, and I think this is important to understand because we are not defining or estimating GDP as such. We are simply saying what GDP 0405 would have been had it been forward projected. Okay, so we look for defining composing variables. Usual critique of you know explanatory models would not apply automatically. So the cherry picking argument is not quite valid in AS study. This is my feeling because I went through the study as well. Okay. Yeah, but, you know, uh, yeah, must see this question, I, yeah, so I've got it. Now, why this overestimation? I think that's very important. Not purposive, not manipulative. So, obviously, AS is in a better, I mean, Arvind is in a much, much better position to answer this, and it's quite acceptable. So, petroleum price fall, which he mentions, uh, you know, could be questionable as, you know, if that is the only reason. See, uh, the need for double deflation goes without saying, but since it's not being done, you know, there, uh, you know, I'm not talking about that at this moment. But let's say what would happen if there is a positive shock to the terms of trade. That means there's a positive shock to the aggregate supply curve. So then it falls. And there would be a rise in the demand quite like the U.S. witnessed after the trade treaty with China in 1993 when it experienced a positive, you know, uh, kind of AS shock terms of trade shock, which allowed the U.S. to grow faster and perhaps, you know, Alan Greenspan to spend a little bit more. So that's part of it. But the point is when you measure the GDP, that should not affect it because these are pass-through changes in prices. They're not the expected kind of values. So there is, at best, there will be a slight delay in the, in, the, in the changes. So therefore, the falling petroleum prices could not be an explanation. Uh, and also, I'd say that, look, the uh, the government had a kind of sliding scale excise duty. So if the prices fell globally, we raised the excise duty, okay, to quite some extent. So therefore, the falling petroleum prices could not be an explanation. However, that raises a very interesting issue. Perhaps the real issue is the terms of trade of small versus large. So in a in a recessionary situation, given the bimodal structure of the Indian economy. What actually happens is the larger guys who are in vendor relationship with the smaller fellows, they squeeze the smaller fellows in terms of the price. Okay? And therefore, their money value added, their money measure of value added of the larger ones is slightly over-reported. Okay? Given this terms of trade form. Uh, now, if the method of computing GDP is going to take the larger units or those which are, have the data as the datum and extend it to the smaller units, pretending that there is no you know, dynamic structural change between them in terms of the terms of trade, then that is certainly going to over-report the GDP as estimated. And given that a lot of the estimation is based on you know, uh, extending or assuming that what is true for the set where we have the numbers should be true for the set where we don't have the numbers. In other words, that there is no non-reporting or a reporting bias in the, in the whole thing. And this has been pointed out by Nagraj and several others as well. You know. So I would think that this needs serious examination. Okay? And the very fact that we get larger divergence in the manufacturing sector and services associated with manufacturing where there's a bimodality and interfirm relationship uh, you know, what it does is it distorts the estimation of value added in a down cycle. And similarly, it may perhaps also mute the rise in an up cycle, which also I find. Okay. So, uh, 
you know so implications you know can kiss goodbye to using national income for macroeconomic management already cpi is problematic with its amazing absurd 45% weight on food read actually vegetables onions tomatoes and potatoes since grain prices don't move so literally is the rbi dancing to you know tomato potato and uh, onion prices that's the question i'm asking okay and should macroeconomic policy be a victim of potato and onion prices now should it be a victim of a data which is going to be very very stable because as i said there is a the gdp figures are going to be very stable it's not going to fall when there is a real fall it's not going to really rise when there is a real rise so uh, so you know it, it's a it, even if it's it's a deviant compass you know if if it's not a broken thing so where is going to be macroeconomic management how much of gva 11 to 11 12 is really imputed my sense is that in trying to be more comprehensive and encompassing smaller and smaller units we have lost the game in terms of being sensitive to time wise changes okay so now let me just share the graph and i think that should be you know uh, that gives you a good idea now this is for uh, manufacturing so what you see as the red and the blue lines are the fit of the data and the model okay so what you see are those and uh, what you see are the forward projection okay it's not model 1 and 4 it's the mo it's the data and the model okay and you can see that the uh, that what we are doing is we are forward projecting it okay in two ways by using model 1 and 2 so the fit is very good over the period where the data exists 0 4 0 5 and therefore we are justified in forward projecting and when we do that what we get is that green line is what the gva 11 12 growth rates are so it's very clear that there is an overestimation but there's also an underestimation some period you know so overall the gva to you know 11 12 is far more stable because there is an inbuilt price mechanism between large and small in all these kind of industries where there's a you know by modality of the of the structure which is going to hurt which is going to you know misreport and the same is true you can see here as well while you see much greater volatility in trade transport storage and communication in 0405 and uh, you know estimates 0405 is given in red the estimated 0405 that is the model estimates are given by the uh, by the blue line and then the blue line is extended you can see the difference between the blue line and the uh, green line and these are all in growth rates so that squiggies squiggle i mean series which is squiggling you know if they can correlate it means that the model is good it should be because you know we want to use definitional and other categories so you can see this is from an earlier picture that actually the whole debate on you know the so called what is it you know so called expectations based killing that given price expectations rising in a in a world where the inflation is rising but not the core inflation is rising i need to kill the demand in to prevent the expectations from rising is kind of falsely put because during the period when this was being argued you can very clearly see that all commodity inflation is very closely related to just two things primary and fuel and look further the manufacturing inflation wpi for manufacturing is also closely related to the uh, fitted inflation for wpi so the commodity inflation is literally driving the uh, you know the the food fuel commodity inflation is literally driving macroeconomic policy and it's 45% weight it's high time we question it that that's something which i would add okay uh um, so the two point, finally what i would say is that you know the danger is really for you know uh the not the compass being wrong and therefore we navigating the wrong way okay yeah so some since i have a bit of time i'll just we are running out of okay time. then i'll i'll close here thank you <laughs> yeah. i just saw that Uh, thank you, Professor Morris. Uh, now our last uh, speaker, Professor Sen. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Tian. Uh, but Shekhar, no thanks. Um, I was worried about this. Uh, Tian began by saying that Arvind is a two-person show. 
So I was prepared for a two is to one competition, but this has now become three is to one, and I'm seriously overmatched. <laughs> but since I pretty much anticipated this, I had the sense not to have a slideshow. <laughs> um, it, it would be remarkably stupid. So I prefer to speak, I prefer to respond, and I hope to generate a little bit of debate. At the heart of what both of them have done lies one thing, which is the remarkable, remarkable relationship, close relationship, between the various physical measures and the GDP estimates prior to 11-12. That underlies both of their analysis very, very strongly. Big surprise. Most of these volume indicators that have been used are precisely the indicators which were used by the CSO to calculate the GDP. So if you are taking the parts and then correlating it to the sum of the parts, of course you're going to get good relationships. Okay, so no surprise. It breaks down later, right? Because you're now using a series which is completely independent of those parts. Right? Does that give you enough ammunition to question the latter series. Perhaps it does. Perhaps it goes against one's uh, sort of sense of what is right, what is natural. After all, physical indicators should uh, correlate some way with the, the GDP estimates. But you'd be surprised. I think, you know, Irvin talked about cognitive problems. Sorry? Cognitive problems. But I think Sebastian mentioned a cognitive problem which is rampant, which is that he talks with a thousand people from the, the business sector every year, and all of them say, what? 7% growth. Well, so have I talked with them. And you know what? Every one of them, when they think of growth, they think of the top line, which is the growth of sales. How many units have you sold? They are not thinking about the value added. That's a cognitive problem because when you're talking about GDP, you're really not talking about volumes, you're not talking about the top line, you're talking about what's essentially operating profits plus compensation to employees. So let me begin from the other side. And mind you, I am not trying to defend what the CSO is doing. I see a whole complement of CSO people out here. They are much more capable of defending themselves than I am. But I take it from a somewhat different perspective. And the perspective is, supposing I do not question the GDP series in the manner that it has been questioned by the two of them, but I will question it in a somewhat different way. What is it telling me about the Indian economy, and do I have any corroborative evidence that that is true? Arvind did mention several times that I have raised the possibility of productivity growth. Yes, I have, and Arvind says there's no evidence of productivity growth. And why is there no evidence of productivity growth, Arvind? Because profits are not rising. Right? Collapsing. Profits are collapsing. <laughs> Wonderful. Now, supposing I do take, as I said, start from the premise that there is nothing wrong with the volume estimates and there is nothing wrong with the value added estimates. How do I bridge the divide? And the answer is very simple, actually, when you think about it. Which is, since the value added is profits plus compensation to employees, the only way the 
profit can actually go down is if compensation to employees actually goes up. And I have looked at the numbers, and lo and behold, that has been precisely true. Now you may say, how does that square with the recent NSS report, which shows a serious, serious increase in unemployment, with many company reports which show they've actually downsized their workforce. And again, there is a answer, may not be the right one, but there is an answer, which is you're replacing a lot of low-skill labor with few high-skill, highly paid labor. Why would you do that? Is there any conceivable reason why that would happen? And there is. And the reason simply is, if the technology that you're using is going up. You know, there's been a lot of fear mongering in recent years about automation, you know, pulling us down. Well, I have news for you guys. If the manufacturing data from the MCA is correct, automation has come. It's been there for the last at least seven, eight years. You asked about productivity growth and that there is no evidence of productivity growth. To my mind, there is actually very good evidence of it. And I would advise uh, Erwin to go back to the, the numbers. Although, you know, I have great sympathy for everybody who complains that the MCA data is simply not available to us to do anything productive about it. So you can assume what the uh, CSO has done is right. Take the, the MCA data, and I, and I have done this, and look at a very, very simple ratio. And that is the ratio of the value added to the value of output. During the period 2011, 12 to 2015, 16, which I looked at very carefully, this ratio was growing at 4.5% per annum. That 4.5% Arvind would pretty much explain your entire discrepancy. Just the 4.5%. The value added to the value of output ratio, which is a measure of productivity. Right. But leave that part for the, for the moment. A whole bunch of uh, statements have been made. Hmm? One is relating a whole bunch of, uh, what should I say? Uh, supposedly independent exogenous variables to the GDP estimates. Now, since the GDP estimates then come essentially from corporate data, I think the real question to ask is why are Indian corporates swimming against the tide? Everything is going south, Indian, corporate India is going north. It becomes a different question. It doesn't then become a question of measurement, it becomes a question of behavior of companies in the Indian context. This is something that Sebastian is far more equipped to handle than I am, despite the fact that I am an MBA and so is Irvin. But both of us, I think, forgot our MBA stuff a long, long time ago. No, nothing. But, but Sebastian is much more current on these issues. But that's really the question to ask. Which leads naturally into a point that Sebastian made, which I think is extremely important, and this is something that the CSO really needs to take on board, which is the use of corporate data for extrapolating and es estimating what's happening to the non-corporate sector, whether this has validity or not. In a regime of relatively stable technologies, that the assumption that the two move together essentially is an assumption which means 
that both sides are being driven essentially by demand side factors. But where technology is changing rapidly and the likelihood it's changing for the larger and the richer corporations, that relationship becomes questionable. And I think this is a legitimate criticism and it's a criticism that should be taken on board because this is going to persist in the future. It's not going to go away in a hurry. And in fact, the, the gap may in fact increase as we, as, as we go along. Which brings me then to Erwin's killer chart. I love that chart, you know, 2.5% there, 2.5% here. We've licked the problem. OK, if we've licked the problem, then clearly the first part of the exercise uh, doesn't really matter. I mean, you know, who, who cares about the nominal value added since the whole problem seems to be in crisis? The only problem, of course, is that as far as the, and this I think Sebastian mentioned fairly clearly, is that the weightage that's given in the CPI and the uh, GDP deflator are very different. And I think the chart that Sebastian put up pretty much answers that question. In a situation where you have agricultural prices rising very, very rapidly, all right? That's going to push the CPI up. All right? When agriculture prices are collapsing, that's going to push the CPI down. Whether or not this phenomenon, but just because these weights are so different, does this actually address the problem that Arvind has raised? Finally, let me talk about using the GST data. As far as the GST data is concerned, my sense is the GST data is actually a very, very good way of measuring essentially what's called intermediate consumption. That is consumption of commodities by production units, that is by companies. I don't think, it may not be a bad way of trying to figure out what's happening to investment. But as far as consumption is concerned, I'm not sure it's going to give you very much information. For the very simple reason that as far as B2C transactions are concerned, unless there is a massive improvement in the, uh, the enforcement of the GST, one can already see huge gaps appearing in the, the, the trade process, which are staying completely outside the GST net. And a lot of this is perfectly legitimate. So GST as a B, measure of B2B transactions, I think, excellent, but B2C transactions, I'm not very sure. And I'd be very, very careful playing around with it. Having said that, I would also like to point out to you that you clearly have a lot more influence within finance ministry than the poor CSO guys do, because they've been trying to get hold of GST data for the last two years with zero success. The GST guys ain't releasing it because they are scared that they will be subjected to the same kind of verification that the CSO is being subjected to now. Thank you. Um, well, three to one or one is to three, we do now have a debate. Um, one option is for our two first two speakers to respond to what Pranav has just said. Uh, the other option is that we throw up questions, throw it open to questions from the floor, and um, Arvind and Professor Morris can respond uh, whenever they come into the responses. So, Mihir. Thank you. Uh, excellent presentation, Arvind. And 
and, and Sebastian, and, and you've convinced me, but I do want to sh maybe sharpen the points that were made by Pranab in two ways in the interest of just having you think about it. So I think what is possible is that there's big productivity increases in retail and services. You have a colleague, uh, Jason Furman, who made his career by pointing out that in the United States in the 1990s, Walmart alone, just through IT and the distribution, added a point of GDP per growth per year. So there's some notion that maybe there's an IT revolution happening in the retail and distribution channels that is not observable through exports that is driving this. I'm not saying I believe this. I'm, I'm just trying to give it to you. Uh, the second thing is, have you used stock market data at all? Because my instinct, I, I don't know the data, but my intuition is that India has outperformed the other emerging markets dramatically during this relevant period. Which might mean, for example, that everyone's looking at the wrong GDP data and following it, or it means that actually there is something that is going on at a fundamental level at the corporate sector that is interesting and maybe productivity related. So that's a long-winded way of saying, you know, if you're right, uh, would you like to share your position on the Sensex and are you shorting it? Because uh, otherwise, <laughs> there's something wrong going on. Um, Kaushik. Uh, Arvind, um, and it applies a little bit to what Sebastian said. I'm uh, extremely persuaded, I have to say. Um, I was skeptical. I was picking this debate up from the pop. I didn't read your paper, but a lot of the secondary material coming out, people writing, I was reading. And I'm glad that you also emphasize that you're not giving an alternative method for computing GDP, which is what was going around a lot. Having said that, because it was fitting in with some a few indicators which I do watch. Savings and investment, uh, I do watch, and it is quite uh, notable that uh, it's going down, uh, going down quite actually sharply, which is worrying. Um, exports, which everyone is ri writing about, I was watching, and now what you present here is very, very uh, persuasive. I, I should also say that there are bits of it which I don't understand the discrepancy, like the GDP deflator and CPI. During high inflation, when different goods are all rising at different rates, you can get this, but it's quite stunning. I have to look at it more carefully. Where I have a disagreement with you is not really the analytical part, so I'm actually feeling very persuaded, is the normative part of it, that um, uh, 4.5 is disaster, India is not a disaster, therefore 4.5 is wrong, which is, by the way, Aristotle's syllogism that you just used, very nice use of that. But... Um, that normative part, 4.5 for India, is pretty bad, I would argue. See, I mean, India is a developing economy. When China was at our level of per capita income growth, China was growing at 10% per annum. 4.5% per annum now, uh, it's not disaster is too strong a word, but it's, it is really very, very worrying, because also if it's 4.5 over a period from 2011 to now, there are probably years when it's dropping to three years, it's going to five. And another thing which you referred to is uh, correct, that if India grows 5% and China grows 5%, China being about four times richer, that 5% is much more than for India. So 4.5% is pretty bad. You have to do a lot of rethinking, not just about how we compute our GDP, but about policies as well. One technical point, because it's such a nice paper, one, uh, but this is a pretty much an economist point. I didn't like your over-focus on investment growth. You should instead use, which is doing fine now because it is actually falling. But otherwise, if you look at, think of a country that is growing very rapidly, the period when uh, China is growing very rapidly, investment is close to 50%, 40%. Singapore, that time investment can't grow anymore. So ideally, you should use investment with GDP growth, instead of investment growth and GDP growth, which right now is doing fine for India, but it's such a nice method you're using, which you can extend in the long run, you should use investment and GDP growth. Thank you. Okay, um, maybe um, both of you can respond at this point, and then we'll take more questions. Especially and you may also want to respond to uh, what Pranab said. So, do you want to come in first? Yeah, I thought, you know, while productivity, you know, could have changed, but essentially when you work 
on the demand side, okay, and if all the demand measures are low, then uh, that the fact that productivity has risen could not have, uh, you know, held back the argument. Okay, that's all I'm saying. Okay, so that's so. So therefore, you know, one would not venture into looking at productivity. However, when you look at it, uh, you know, uh, overall productivity of the economy may not have been that high unless you accept upfront that this GDP figures are right and you know that therefore the productivity has gone up. Okay. We need some independent measures of productivity and even if it is there, if the demand side measures are as low as they are, then it's kind of difficult. Yeah, see there, you know, yeah, sure. See what he was saying and which I also think is extremely important is that if you look at macroeconomic policy as it has happened uh, for quite some time now, and that spans even the UPA regime, it is something of this of the following kind that we have shifted measures from, uh, you know, originally from WPI to CPI, then again to CPI, then to core inflation, and so on. Now the RBI's forecasts of inflation, conditional on its own actions, that means after taking into account its own actions, have typically exceeded the the realized inflation, I mean, have typically been below the realized inflation by quite a number of points. That means the RBI has been extremely conservative going forward. I'm not talking about the current, the current regime, but almost all of that. Now, why is that so? Because you are giving too high a weight for the CPI measure of inflation. The CPI measure of inflation is driven by the NSSO 11-12 data on the va on the consumption expenditure values. Now, as we all know, and this is something which any good student can, should be able to show, the consumption CPI measure, okay, the consumption val the the weights given in the CPI is nothing but the, uh, you know, the NSSO 11-12. Now, in the NSSO 11-12, we all know that NSSO is highly underestimates the overall consumption. So, but it doesn't underestimate, for instance, food consumption. Therefore, it's not a consumption measure. It's a measure of, I would call it a person-weighted measure. And that's not what you need for managing macroeconomic management. That's a good measure for working out the human condition, but it's not a good measure for the, you know, consumption expenditure. It's not consumption expenditure weighted, let me put it. And therefore, when you use the CPI, which the Rangarajan committee said, they made a huge error in this, not realizing that the uh, NSSO is not the right way to go about measuring the, the the relevant inflation measure which you use for macroeconomics. So as a result, the the uh, monetary side has also been rather you know tight for quite some time. So it's kind of unimaginable that we should have registered a growth you know of as high as 7.2, 7.5 percent, and so on. Okay. So so therefore, I am pretty convinced that the growth was closer to what Arvind is saying. Although you know my own method kind of gives the confidence, but it's a very high confidence that it should have been minimally at least 1.5% below what was given. And in manufacturing, it should have been about 4, 4.5%. Okay? Now, the explanation that I gave is only a tentative one. What I'm saying is that perhaps the terms of trade difference, the terms of trade between the larger and the smaller units, the unorganized and the organized, uh, is important. Why? The organized is more likely to give data. The unorganized or the smaller ones, you'll have less data or it's likely to be delayed. So when the CSO uses the, uh, the data on what is available to forecast or to take a view on what is not available, there is a availability bias of the data. I mean, the, 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 those which are available would tend to be those which are not doing too badly. Those which are not available, even in the corporate sector, are those which are tending to you know, do badly. So therefore, there's an inbuilt bias against any kind of volatility. So it's also true that the current GDP measures are giving you very low volatility compared to the earlier GDP measures, particularly when you look at it sectorally. Okay? And that I showed you. So this needs serious investigation. Okay? Of course, the other side is that you know, we can talk about policy, but I'm, I'm assuming that this is not the place. Um, yeah. Um, first, uh, uh, thanks to uh, uh, Pranobda and, and Sebastian for a great presentation and uh, for wonderful questions from the audience. Um, 
So, um, I mean, I cannot uh, let this go because, uh, okay, point one. It is true, and Pranav is absolutely right, that there are three ways of doing this. You can do production, you can do demand, and you can do income, right? All trying to get the same thing. You say, okay, this is income, so it's profits and wages, but you still have to deflate and get some sense of what are the real incomes here. Uh, so you just can't say the nominals are going up and therefore you know, GDP is going up. You have to have some sense of what's happening to real. But let's leave that aside. Okay, uh, supposing he, uh, Pranavda is conceding that profits could have declined sharply. So just a simple, simple, very crude calculation that I've just done. Let's say the capital share in, uh, is 0.3. That's kind of typical, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. But to stack it against myself, 0.3. Profit, according to what I had, declined by, it says about 25, but let's say 20 percentage points. So profits and wages equals, let's say, G GDP. Profits, if a 30% share declines by 20%, your wage bill, again, don't hold me to this, has to increase every year in real terms by something like 17 to 18% every year. So ladies and gentlemen, on this theory, we should have a wage bill in India that rises in real terms by 18 percentage, a percent every year. If that is true, so that's, I mean, I don't know how many would actually believe that. If that is true, yeah. Uh, no, even government, no, government has been cutting, you know. <laughs> government. And even if that is true, which, I mean, really boggles the imagination, then consumption should be soaring. And we see, you know, a collapse in consumption. So I, I think, you know, we have to be a little bit careful here when we offer these explanations. I think we should work through the kind of simple implications in terms of the earth. The, so, so that's all I'll say about, about uh, uh, Pranab those things. And, you know, when he says, I didn't quite understand, he said corporate India is going north. I, I, I don't know whether, I just read Nainan's piece on, uh, on corporate India, but we leave that aside. That's just a, so this kind of segues into uh, at least your first point, Mehir, which is that if you see, remember, I, th I remember the IT debates in the US, you know, and I think the big debate was that, you know, IT as an input into other sectors, therefore, it, but then it should show up in high profits in all these other sectors. Yeah, and you know, and, you know, profits are not just not rising. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a 20 to 25 per real term drop in profits. I mean, what, how is it inconceivable that productivity is growing? How is it conceivable? Uh, because, and if it is, then wage bill is rising at 18 percentage points in re percent in real terms. I mean, we should have gangbusters consumption. Now, which relates to, uh, uh, so, so Mir, the point about the stock market, uh, I, I, I haven't you know, focused on that. I think it's a very good uh, suggestion. Uh, I, I was just trying to look just at the sensex between 2012. I, I don't know whether it's actually boomed or not, but good point, we should look into it. But of course, I don't know this uh, thing well enough that after all, if you believe the Schiller kind of stuff, you could have you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, investors getting ahead of themselves. But, but that's something that I, I shouldn't say very much about because I don't know enough about that, but it's certainly po uh, possible. Uh, uh, Kaushik, thanks for wonderful comments. Uh, I think on your technical point, let me think about that. Remember, I don't want to use investment to GDP because the denominator is, you know, kind of iffy. That's why I used uh, uh, investment growth. But what you're saying, I, I need to think about. It's, it's quite a good suggestion. But see, your other point, I think, is actually a, 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 a very good one in the following sense. Now, uh, I, and I'll tell you what, uh, how to reconcile what I'm saying is not a disaster uh, and good with Kaushik's point about actually it's not very good, is uh, Kaushik, uh, first want to say that 4.5%, uh, you know, within India convergence we've done well because when we were poorer we grew slower. But you're absolutely right that 
if you, uh, amongst the one trillion dollar economies in India as well, but there are countries like Bangladesh, Vietnam, Laos, Ethiopia, who are doing better and whose per capita GDP is lower, therefore in, in that's kind of gets uh, you know, your, your point. Now, the way I would reconcile uh, uh, all these is by saying is that, look, I call the twin balance sheet uh, a shock. The point is that it's not exogenous. So, so if you say that's actually policy, then you're absolutely right. Then, you know, conditional on the policy we followed, we got four and a half, but then some of those policies, you know, we should have changed. So, so in that sense, I'm, you know, I'm kind of, you know, just treating the, the, the financial sector problems, et cetera, as kind of quasi exogenous. Uh, but, but I would insist that at least on some benchmarks that, you know, amongst the large economies, given our own intertemporal thing, you know, we're doing much better, but you're absolutely right that if you think, you know, some of these are policies, then of course, then because of those policies, we're at four and a half, we need to change those policies. Um, just on um, Kaushik's point about, or uh, was it pronounced about labor and uh, capital returns? It's highly unlikely that when profits are being squeezed, uh, wage rates would be going up sharply. Uh, most companies would actually then try to keep wage rates down. And certainly, um, We've seen in the GDP numbers, the corporate uh, savings figure holding up and in sometimes increasing. Whereas if you look at, uh, even in the latest economic survey, you look at the corporate profit trends in relation to top line, uh, they've actually been falling in the last six or seven years from 5.5% to 4.5%. So there is certainly a profit squeeze taking place. And it's highly unlikely that th in that period you would see wages uh, going up rapidly. Sorry, on, uh, on that, can I just say that I know someone is, is uh, doing some work showing that uh, 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 I, I can't disclose it, but that you know at least real wages uh, also uh, real wage growth in the second period has uh, not done very well compared to the first period. And if that is right, and then add that thing, that means uh, L, because if WL has to grow in real terms by 18%, and if, you know, if W growth is slower than in the period previous, L has to be you know, <laughs> growing at some incredible amount to uh, employment growth to justify. Well, let me put it this way. The MCA data itself, remember we, the slowdown in profits that you're talking about, has is recent origin. I'm still talking about up to 2016 because that's surveys period. Uh, the survey goes, data goes yeah. back to before that. So now in that earlier period, the data on the corporate sector, which gives you in fact uh, the, the compensation to employees, compensation to employees was growing much faster than the value added, much faster. All right. Now the question is, why didn't that translate into gangbuster consumption? It did of just the wrong kind. What you did have 17%, 18%, 20% growth in automobiles. All right, now, which we are now regretting is not, not happening, uh, and that's a source of angst. We are talking about a, a class issue here rather than an economic issue. No, no, but the problem is, I think Sebastian got it absolutely spot on which is that non-corporate India has been hurting, has been hurting for a while, post-demonetization has been hurting really badly, and the GDP series does not pick that up. And that is the nature, I think that's the fundamental problem, and if the CS has to fix anything, that is the problem that needs to be fixed. Okay, uh, any more questions? Uh, so I have a question for Arvind, and, and I want to take a shot at answering what Professor Mihir Desai said. So Arvind, I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, and since you're looking at demand side components and you're looking at the negative correlation, et cetera, you showed export import and credit growth as a proxy for investment. I thought the two very important components missing were consumption and government expenditure, because for the longest of time, we have heard that um, India is a consumption fueled economy. Um, and it's not as fueled by investment as exports as many of, let's say, the East Asian countries or Latin American countries have been. And because consumption has been 
booming, except for the recent quarters when consumption is, is not doing well. Uh, and that has been one reason uh, driving growth. And government expenditure has been increased as well. So maybe showing some proxies of consumption and government expenditure may complete the story that you're showing. Um, and this, the, and pr to Professor Mehdesai's point on the stock market, so what, uh, what, what, what probably has been happening is, and from 2016 onwards, the stock market has been rallying, and you're correct. So what happens is in our stock market, there is a very high weightage given to banking sector stock. Um, and ironically, despite the twin balance sheet crisis, every time the government has announced a recapitalization program, there has been an optimism that the banking sector is getting bailed out and rescued, and there has been an enormous investment in the banking stock. And the second thing that really drives up the stock market is foreign investment. Actually, the, the, the major factor that drives up our stock market is not domestic investment, it's foreign investment. And over the last three to four years, there has been a huge amount of foreign capital inflows in the equity market. Um, and it's possible that it's, it's gotten decoupled from the real growth story uh, to some extent, because that foreign capital inflow is coming up a lot from the push factor from the global uh, scenario as much and much less from the pull factor from the domestic scenario. So that could be two reasons why the stock market has been rallying and has gotten decoupled from what has really been happening in the real economy. Thank you. Yeah, there's been a very sharp increase in price earnings ratios if you take the last uh, certainly five, six years uh, from 18x to mid-20s x or higher and market cap has more than doubled. So. Um, uh, yeah. My question is about the CPI. When we are saying that the difference between the CPI and the implicit deflator is 2% now and earlier it was 0.6. Point, oh, but uh, I think the current series of CPI, if we are comparing with that, it was available only after 2010. If we are comparing with AL and RL or IW, I think there is a lot of structural change and this comparison, I am not sure whether after 2010 and 11 it has been compared with CPI U and R or with the earlier series of CPI IW which is a segment specific. So the reason may be. Another thing that we have said that about the CPI 45% weight and this is, I don't know because the CPI index subgroup wise is available any user can use it. It is not necessary that users should use the national index. If they can apply their own weights, PFC weights can be applied. And as far as the underestimation in NSS is concerned, earlier, the, though the underestimation is increasing, the gap between the underestimation in food and non-food now decreasing, and there is a significant underestimation also in case of the food items. So if we see the weights as such, it is not going to make a much effect. And anyway, the indexes are available at the subgroup level. And even, I think, the national accounts also, they apply the index at the subgroup level by using that index and not at the overall. So to blame CPI that it has a 45%, I think this is not fair. Yeah. So this is one. Okay. I think CSI, CSI. Uh, question. Uh, you were mentioning that there is a uh, decrease in real profit of corporate, but from MCA data, what we get is actually the current price figures. So, how you computed that real decrease that you kindly explained that we could not understand. And the second point is uh, you compared in one chart pre. Uh, uh, I mean, the 4-5 series vis-a-vis -vis the 11-12 series with the CPI. But the point is when we are computing the, um, the real uh, growth, there in most of the cases we either use volume extrapolation or I mean in some parts, suppose for example in manufacturing, we are using WPI. So instead of comparing with WPI, I mean the relationship between WPI and uh, growth and WPI and growth for the two phases why you are taking CPI. Okay. Uh, sure. you want to come right now because I will come back. Yeah. No, let's, let's just get one more. We'll get the doctor and I'll just get.
Okay. Okay. Uh, so you can have a, a bilateral also. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, no. I'm, I'm joking. So, so I, I think uh, uh, Rajeshri asked uh, uh, ex excellent questions. Uh, and one of them ties in with uh, uh, nine in your question, which I, I, I didn't answer, which I'll come back to now. Which is that, so I think we need to be clear about this. That if you look at all these experiences of rapid growth, right? Consumption also, also does well. That's why imports and credit do well. But nobody will say that those are consumption-led growth because essentially we think that the broad causation is investment, exports, incomes rise, consumption rises, imports rise, credit rises. So that's kind of the, the model we have. And if you go back, the, virtually, I mean, I, I don't want to say virtually because I'm looking, but uh, where consumption does well and the others don't, and GDP is growing, I think there's virtually no case in history where, where that happens. So you have to be careful about the, the causation. So you can't, because what you're positing actually is that consumption growing and the others not growing can give you sustained 7% growth. I don't think it's ever happened in, for any prolonged period of time. Then the, the other point, very fair point on, on, on government. Um, see, again, you see, uh, th there's a kind of trade-off here, right? If you try and then measure everything on the right-hand side, uh, you're then estimating an identity. But I did go back and, and check to be careful. Government expenditures actually, government expenditure growth, I don't, it's something like 6.5% in the pre-period, it comes down to 5.5% in the second period. So even that cannot you know, possibly explain uh, this. Um, now, on, on the, uh, I, I leave the weightage question to, to the others. Um, so I think what we are, I mean, I think the data is comparing, it's, it's World Bank data because you want to be consistent across uh, countries. Uh, you're comparing, uh, so it's almost certain, I think, that in the pre-period, it's CPI, IW, because that's what we used to have. I mean, we had nothing else. Uh, but ag again, so, so, so the interesting thing there, remember, again, is, that if you think that there was a problem with CPI, IW, whatever, then you would have seen a bigger discrepancy in that period. Whereas, in fact, you see just the opposite that, you know, that period is okay, but, you know, in, the pe in this period is when, you know, when you're measuring everything correctly, the same base, that, that you know, uh, the flipping happens. And then, of course, you know, again, you have to see this, why doesn't this happen around the world? Why is it only happening in India? And, and so then we have to look into that uh, in, in some, more, some more detail. Uh, on the um, CPI, WPI, I, I, I think that it's in India because in some ways the GDP deflator is some weighted average of CPI and WPI. Uh, um, it, it, I mean, uh, broadly, we could, you, we could do the comparison as well and you will get something, uh, something uh, you know, probably more stark because uh, the wedge will be probably much greater in the second period. Uh, but whatever you may say in terms of what you think, but uh, I mean, uh, the movements of, you know, okay in one period and suddenly changing in another period, which is consistent with these other movements, is to me something that's certainly uh, of note that warrants much greater scrutiny. Yeah, uh, firstly on the government expenditure side, uh, now what my data shows, because I have quarterly estimates parallelly being done, what it shows is the following. And it also ties up with, uh, you know, what happened with the new government coming in. When the new government came in, the first budget was a nine-month one. And in that, the given the whatever the reason, but I suppose extreme centralization, most departments actually did not spend even what they were supposed to spend. So there was a contraction. Somewhat the same continued towards the half of the next year, and then it revived with the backwash effect of the residual. And that gave actually in my data two, two years, roughly about three quarters, where my estimates are higher than the, than the official estimates. Okay? And then there is a sharp fall where my estimates are lower than the official estimates. And you know why, the demon. Okay? And now I have not done it, it actually goes back. Okay? So in a sense, what I am saying is that the current methodology is one where the volatility upfront is killed, either due to the kind of uh, problems with the 
with the CPI, WPI or whatever, or with what I said in the manufacturing sector, the terms of trade effect between small and large. Now, coming to your point, you know, that the CPI is a good measure and it's all open and so on. Absolutely, I mean, I have no problem with the CPI per se. But the point is, the CPI is not a consumption-weighted CPI. It's derived from the NSSO, where there is a near equal weight to every person. And suppose if I start with the assumption that India has an extreme inequality, okay, then you're going to miss out a lot of consumption, which falls into the so-called 10th decile. So the 10th decile is completely non-representative. Okay? So uh, therefore, and what you need for macroeconomic policy is not a person-weighted one, but a consumption-weighted one. Okay. However, for understanding the human condition like poverty and so on, the CPI, etc. is a wonderful indicator. Okay. So this particular difference is not understood by academia and that is where all the mistakes have been made. So, you know, going with this kind of a CPI or with those consumption weights, uh, the income distribution that you get in India is not too bad. But actually the income distribution may be extremely bad once you recognize the uh, that the log normal distribution of income, if it's extremely log normal, I mean, if the income distribution is bad, and we all know it's log normal anywhere, then you have to oversample the, the rich, okay, and really oversample it, okay, which obviously is not being done because there's a near equal weight except at the very top, which is not good enough, okay. Okay, I have five people waiting, so, and we have uh, less than 10 minutes. So I'll have to close with the five. I've got you on the list. So starting here. Uh, uh, of course, you know, uh, me and Pranab have debated on this several times. But this issue is something which I have, uh, you know, I've never been able to uh, argue with him. Uh, and he, this point he has been saying right from uh, right from the beginning that there has. Uh, earlier we were using volume-based measures and today we were value-based measures. I think we, earlier we were using uh, uh, a volume measure as it calls only for IIP. Everything else value added. And that, that, even, that we do even today. For the first two years it's still, therefore that hasn't changed at all. To my knowledge, maybe I'm missing something. Other point, again he talks about value added to value of output has changed. That represents enormous improvement. In, you know, in, in productivity. I, I, in fact, you know, I, I've been puzzled by this. You know, ever since 2015, he has been, you know, I'm always puzzled by this famous statement. He always keeps making it. So I went back to uh, Encyclopedia Economics. Look, where, where is the ratio of value added to value of output? What does it tell you? Actually, in economics, it tells you nothing about productivity. In fact, this ratio, in fact, you're using, uh, uh, Pranab says he has used last four year data. I have used data from 1972 73 using ASI. Okay, I have plotted it. And interestingly, this ratio has fallen secularly between 72 73 uh, right through. So if, if what Pranam is saying correct, then the productivity levels must have been much, much higher in the 70s than what, it, what is today. So therefore, how is it possible? I can't figure out. So I think uh, this, is, this is a question I always wanted to ask uh, Pranam. If, if somebody wants, I have all the data with me, I can show it. Thank you. Okay, there was a lady in the back. Uh, thanks. Thanks. I, I, I think the debate is really very fascinating and um, just a couple of points I would like to make, um, you know, um, coming from the tax side, I'm working with the tax data. Um, so on the GST, it, um, I uh, would just like to say that it, it may be a better measure to get an indication of B2B transactions to make any estimate of GDP from GST data using B2C transactions is much harder. So we are trying to do things like that, but we are coming across a lot of uh, problems. Uh, there is a large degree of informality in the economy. A lot of transactions are not being captured. So we are still quite some way of going there. That's one point. The second is on forecasting. Uh, there are a lot of economists sitting out here, and we all know uh, how forecasting um, leading to f uh, estimates from forecasting can have large degrees of standard errors depending on the type of forecasting method you're using and the type of variables that you're using. 
um, more robust analysis or drawing, you know, uh, like Mrs. Uh, Morris has done, I would think uh, drawing just from a forecasting exercise um, would be a little uh, bit harder to uh, quest question all more robust estimates. Um, not to say either way that whether the estimates are good or bad, I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying drawing that analogy from a forecasting exercise would, I would think, uh, need to be, I, I would add some cautionary caveats to that. Uh, similar with, um, with again, cross-sectional data, particularly cross-sectional data using um, international databases, and I've used a large number of World Bank databases. Again, cross-sectional analysis is fraught with a lot of inconsistencies. It depends what you're measuring. It depends what variables you're taking. It depends whether those variables have been corrected. So, to ha and whether the group in a cross-section, the moment you put, instead of 15, you put 25 countries, your whole results changes. On what, how are you selecting these groups? What are the type of similarities? How are you correcting? So I, I, not to say that, I'm saying that these things are things that you might need to look at. Thank you. Um, there were two gentlemen in the back. So both of you, uh, I'd request you to be brief because we are running out of time. This is based on, again, the data is a bit old. It is only up to FY17, 1617. But there is the NSSO data. So we are taking as it is given. But what we had seen when we look at the wage component and non-wage component, uh, aggregate level, you find the wages growing faster than return to capital. But the problem is, in the industry, if you classify, then you find a reverse way, where the your wage component is growing slower, whereas the return to capital is growing faster. So probably in, at aggregate level, you may find some sort of productivity gains or saying that wages are growing faster, but in the industrial sector, your uh, wages are being squeezed. And the worst is coming ma mainly because of the households, where, where the wages are being squeezed very hard and that being roughly 40% of the entire economy, and these are all nominal terms. This, any response on this from the panelists? Thank you. Okay, uh, I have a question for Professor Subramaniam. Actually, I have gone through his paper, what he has been published from Harvard, and he also elaborated here. He has pointed out some inadequacies on estimation of GDP in national accounting from MCA21 database. As we all know that MCA21 database is basically based on 37,000 companies which they use and available in XBRL format. So instead of that, if GST database is used together with the income tax corporate database, which comes to around 6.5 lakh companies annual return, whether that will significantly improve the national accounting? That is one question. Second question uh, my is directed to uh, Professor Shen. When he said that in GST, basically you will get B2B, but you won't get B2C in the granular level. Since we are dealing with the GST database in the tax policy research unit, both in the income tax as well as in GST, so our finding is that for B2B transaction, there is a value chain for you can measure ITC. So if you measure ITC with the B2B, you can measure that, but ultimately your cash is collected from B2C. So if you can measure cash from the B2C, then though not exactly the entire informal economy can be captured, but to a sizable portion it can be captured. That is our experience. So I would like your more illustration on these points. Thanks. Okay, last question. Yeah. Just one quick question. I mean, most of the debate has been concentrated on MCA 21. I mean, we think problems if we are able to show problems in manufacturing, most of our GDP-related problems get resolved. Is, I just wanted to get your sense that it's really sufficient to look at manufacturing only to be able to say all this. I mean, 55% of our GDP comes from services. 
we've really not even talked about what are the kind of problems we have of measurement in services as such. It's been eight years we've not had an employment unemployment survey. It's been almost eight years that eight to nine years that we've not had an updated consumption expenditure survey. The PLFS is just getting introduced by the time it will get introduced in the national accounts, it will be furthermore, I don't know, maybe three, four years from now. So I just wanted to get into sense, even Dr. Sen can explain that, you know, are the problems really in manufacturing or they are elsewhere? Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, let's start in reverse order. Uh, Dr. Sen first and we'll end with the original sinner. <laughs> uh, well. Well, um, I'll come to a maze point last. <clears throat> but uh, let me take the, the issue on uh, GST and uh, being able to capture the, the B2C uh, segment effectively because ultimately that's where the money comes from. And then it filters through the system. Theoretically, if you really knew what the ratios were, you should be able to calculate back what the B2C transaction was, right? Uh, theoretically. The problem, of course, <clears throat> is where you have a large informal sector, particularly a sector which is large enough, uh, which is under the GST threshold, right? You can actually get completely parallel delivery systems uh, coming into existence. Which would, uh, which would bypass the, the, the GST in its entirety. And so you won't be able to capture them at all. So you will still need to have some form of a, of a survey to pick that element up. Now having said that, the, really the important thing is that if you look at, uh, at economies, as economies grow, as they become more complex, the proportion of B2B transactions tend to go up. So the problem that you're, you're talking about in terms of measurement uh, becomes less and less as the economy develops. It never vanishes, but it becomes less. You know, uh, the whole issue of that Nagaraj has been talking about is yes I have actually looked at the SI data as well you're not unique in that um, and it in fact fell secularly till 2004 and then it starts rising albeit very gradually and if you look at the post 2010 10, 11 period, it rises much faster. It rises less than the GVA GVO ratio that's coming from the, the MCA, but it follows a similar pattern over that period. But that's really not the issue. Really, the issue is think of what that ratio is. It is really not the productivity of labor that we are talking about here. What we are talking about is the productivity in materials consumption. That's what is being measured by that ratio. Just increase in productivity of the labor does not change the GVA at all. That's just a pure distributive thing. So here what is happening is it, what it, the data is suggesting that Indian manufacturing, which was extremely uh, inefficient in the consumption of materials, inputs, and energy has actually improved pretty dramatically. Now, whether that has happened in other sectors, and in fact, it has happened, but this number is again given to us in the, uh, the national accounts. They give you the GVA, GVO in the national accounts as well, and unless you're actually accusing them of fudging it, they will show you exactly the same pattern I'm talking about. It's very much there. So just take a look at it. I've done it at the, uh, the commodity, the industry level, the activity level, and it's fairly clear what is going on. The point is that nowhere in our discussions of GDP growth are we talking about technology. 
I mean, I'm a little surprised that I'm the only one who's talking about it in this galaxy of speakers. But the fact of the matter is that technological change in India has been relatively rapid in the recent past. And surely it's going to show up in GDP somewhere. That does not take away the problem that Sebastian mentioned, that the big and the small are behaving differently, and therefore we do need to delink them. And that brings me essentially to a mess problem. That what do we have which we can use to replace the MCA data being extrapolated to the non-corporate sector? And the obvious answer is actually employment. And that's what we need to focus on. Now, this recognition happened. I mean, after all, the PLFS wasn't born yesterday. It was in conception since 2010. It just came into existence recently for all kinds of problems. But this is fairly clear that sooner or later, the national accounts will have to use employment data as a volume proxy for what's happening in the unorganized sector in the country. Yeah, I thought I'd only say uh, on this whole value added and uh, output and so on. Yeah, it's what Nagarat said is true, that it's well known that as the division of labor increases, the ratio of value added to output continuously declines. In other words, the, out, the input output ratios keep rising because production gets fragmented, a lot more indigenous goods come up. Uh, so the way we work out productivity is often to just deal with value added and not with output. One doesn't care because the assumption there is a material pass through. Correct? That the material or any component is a pass through. So I don't even bother. We are adding value on it. So only the value added comes up. And therefore, you use only the factors as inputs, K and L. But suppose if I use material as factor, then your me output measure would be O rather than value added. And that can also be done where there's a material price and uh, so on. And that can lead to some understanding of the material efficiency. Okay, That means how the material is actually used. And I would think that all efficiencies have gone up in India over such a long period that we are talking about. And certainly the productivity has gone up, the labor productivity. What may not have gone up as rapidly was the capital productivity, but my sense is with the IT and so on coming, even that would have gone up. Yeah, but the point is not whether or not productivity has gone up in this debate. Okay, the point is what has been the output growth. Okay, see if we were to break up India's output growth, and I keep doing that into technology, labor, and capital. Okay, the usual way. Uh, for all, as a developing economy, the share of input growth is pretty large, and it has to be much lower than in the U.S. But it's still somewhat you know, lower than in Korea in its fastest period or China in its fastest period. Because in an economy where labor is underutilized and amp capital is something which you create, obviously the largest share of growth, 10% growth China, 8% came out of input growth, 2% came out of productivity. But 2 is still higher than India's 1, absolutely. But India's 1 as a proportion of, let us say, 4 or so is actually higher. 4 or 5 is still higher. So that can happen. But the point is that the overall growth is what I thought we were discussing. And in that sense, the, it needs to be conditioned from the demand side, from the income side, which we did not talk about, and from the uh, output side, and from you know, other statistical sides. And when we do all that, my sense is that there is an overestimation. Okay? And you can't get away from that. Uh, even if the productivity growth has been you know, changing. Okay? Uh, so that's what I would say. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, again, uh, terrific comments. Uh, I, I would like to say that uh, actually one very uh, lovely point was made that on the GST uh, things, I don't know enough about how well you can capture B2C and things, I think. But I would just say that we should uh, do our best to use that data because I think we need to get expenditure side estimates. But the wonderful point that was made, which you know I haven't made, but uh, and, and others should take note, is the use of direct 
tax data, that number of whatever, six lakh filers or whatever, that's really an excellent source for, you know, to, to uh, feed into the uh, uh, GDP estimation in India. Because I do know that actually uh, in the year before I came, maybe two years before, I think the economic survey of that year calculated GDP based on the income tax number, which I know that Arbin Modi and Raghu, I think, uh, did that uh, that year. So, so it's a very interesting and a, a very good idea. Uh, one other point uh, kind of relates a little bit to, I uh, uh, failed to address something that Rajeshri asked about, you know, the correlations with consumption measures. The IIP of uh, uh, consumption, also the, the correlations turn perverse in the post period. So, um, and, and, uh, and Pranabda, I mean, you know, uh, uh, the Mar I saw the Marxist in you coming out when you said, uh, uh, you know, or, or the latent Marxist, the lapsed Marxist, what a, uh, whatever, in saying that, you know, oh, actually, you do see consumption because, you know, it's all in, in auto cars, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, and, but, uh, but we have to be a little bit serious here because, you know, uh, I mean, you have to look at some aggregate measure of consumption, you know, and that, if you look at the IIP is one, I mean, I mean the IIP is the main, basis for calculating consumption, but that, I mean, shows a, a halving of the growth rate between the pre-period and post-period. So, I, I mean, you know, numbers have to, I, I mean, uh, 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 Paul Krugman is doing a course and he says there are only two principles in economics. One is you don't get free rupee dollar bills lying around and that's kind of the incentive point. And the other thing is that things must add up. I, I think we have to, whenever we t talk about things, you know, they must add up and I think we shouldn't lose, lose sight of that. Um, the, the, the last point that was made on service, see, I, I want to make a plea to you and to everyone, but before I, I begin that, I want to say that, so because I've tried to work from the demand side and my, the CPI GDP wedge, which is aggregate, uh, so clearly it is showing that there are problems in services too, because the manufacturing, as I showed, can explain maybe 30, 40 percent of the overall. So there's clearly a problem. So, so, so there is an implication from this with services. How it's being mismeasured, part of the reason uh, was actually answered by Rajeshwari in, in one of her columns, which is that uh, the, uh, you know, uh, this I know uh, uh, well because we measure consumer services using the CPI, but producer services, which is 20% of GVA, is deflated by the aggregate WPI in manufacturing, and that creates these biases, uh, et cetera. So, but one thing I, I want to also make clear, because, uh, see, many of the arguments that have been made here about deflators, certainly some of them are conditional on the fact that in the period that I'm measuring, oil prices went down. So it's logical that when oil prices go up, you should see some of that reversal happening. So I think it is work for, uh, you know, uh, f it is work for the future that, you know, we should look into seeing whether, you know, our intuitions about these, the, even the direction of mismeasurement, how that changes as kind of oil prices change. So, uh, so it is not my point that what I've measured for the five years holds forever and ever. It is, it's a, it's a combination of a methodology data and circumstances, you know, uh, input prices going faster and, and those, it's, it's that combination that happens and therefore we should constantly monitor it to see whether it's. Um, uh, I want to end by saying, uh, uh, I, uh, the boss is going to have the last word, that, uh, you know, in the, in the spirit that, you know, I really, really think that this is a debate that we should have, uh, I am going to make uh, the code and data uh, public. Uh, it's got delayed only because I've done uh, more new work in this, so, so cleaning that up takes time. So uh, I will make the, uh, uh, all of that public so that, you know, th the, the essential thing is we have an objective to improve our data. Uh, all of us, you know, CSO has to be the primary institution, but, you know, in our small ways, I think we should all contribute by, pro by providing research and analytical inputs. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Arvind. Um, I'm sorry we've run a little over time, 15 minutes. My apologies, Shekhar. But uh, I think uh, you will all agree that we've had a very rich discussion. Uh, many issues have been thrown up. Uh, there's no conclusion to many of them, of course, over here. But uh, there is a lot of uh, 
a lot of points been thrown up which uh, we need to think about and so i think this issue this this last two hours have been certainly i think uh, been well spent um, i'd like to thank our three speakers uh, pranab sen um, sebastian morris and uh, arvind subramaniam for making their presentations and for leading this debate and uh, my final thanks to shekhar for inviting us here thank you Thank you.